Well, good evening. I'm so happy we're here tonight and not last week. Um, I think, unfortunately, the event, uh, like another lecture, would have been canceled, but we're here to celebrate um, your participation in what I know is going to be a very interesting talk by Dr. Russell Toll around the work of Matthew Wong. Uh, and uh, I'm assuming everybody here has seen that incredible uh, exhibition curated by our own Vivian Lee, who's in the audience, and uh, the show is going from here where, Vivian? Boston, we'll say Boston, okay. So, um, you know, it's reached such notoriety, the exhibition, um, because of her excellent curatorial work that it's uh, being solicited by other museums. But my job, I'm Bonnie Pittman. I used to be the director of the Dallas Museum of Art for many years, and I probably know lots of you in the audience, but I can't see you because the lights are shining in my eye. Um, more importantly, I, um, <laughs> after I left, now, now they fixed that. After I left the museum, I went in, have been in the field of art and medicine, and I teach over at the faculty at UT Southwestern Medical School and Baylor Medical School about the importance of looking at works of art uh, to develop the observation skills of physicians to help them to look more closely. And I have developed a range of programs and lectures. Uh, next week, I'm doing one on the human body the, uh, and anatomy in uh, art history. So that's sort of a, it's an ongoing uh, <clears throat> oh, set of work that I do that comes from my love of art and my involvement now with medicine, medical issues deeply. But that's me. And more importantly, I'm here to introduce Dr. Uh, Russell Toll who oh, I have had the pleasure of meeting several times. He is a, a professor, assistant professor over at the University of uh, UT Southwestern Medical School, and he is also the executive director of Com the Compassion Neuroscience. And one of the things uh, that will be a hallmark as I introduce Russ is that his life is about courage and service and compassion, and you'll see that not only as I introduce him, but more importantly as you listen to his lecture about Matthew Wong. Uh, Russ went to um, the uh, U.S. Military Academy in West Point and graduated from there in engineering, and he married his high school sweetheart. Don't we love that? And they have three wonderful children, um, and she has been a very important part of his uh, uh, career and work as she is a professional nurse too. Um, after West Point, he went to um, over to the um, <clears throat> fought in various units in what in Iraq. That was it. And uh, over there, he did an amazing um, uh, service uh, as he was in the Triangle of Death with a number of other soldiers, many of whom uh, Russ received the bronze star, and many of his uh, soldiers received uh, Purple Hearts, and unfortunately 28 of his uh, uh, companions died during that period. And this deeply affected him and his work going forward in life. When he returned home from the service, um, he immediately went off to become a casualty officer. I had no idea what that was. But as he explained it to me, it's the very difficult duty of going to the homes and informing fa families that their soldiers have been killed or injured, and then helping them to take helping to take care of them as they go through this process of uh, recovery if they've been severely inju injured, and working at Walter Reed Hospital um, to motivate and improve those soldiers and that had been injured in in the uh, in service. Following this, he went on to uh, be study at Stanford. As I said, this is quite a career. And there he got into neuroimaging because he had become very involved in understanding the um, mental capacity of people to recover, the resilience that they needed, and also the compassion that the caregivers and the, and the uh, wounded soldiers had to give to themselves. And he received a number of great distinctions at Stanford. Um, and uh, 
his work was highly recognized, which is why, um, um, if you know Madhukar Trevetti over at UT Southwestern, uh, Russ was invited to come here to Dallas to work at the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care. And this is where, again, his, his deep uh, and abiding life commitment to being compassionate himself, but also to trying to act with compassion towards others and share that knowledge, um, he has been brought into play. He currently curates and analyzes the largest longitudinal study of EEG neuroimaging bases in the country. And as he goes through this work, um, he's working with the National Institute of Health, as well as the American Medical Association, and he's widely published in journals around the country. In the wake of the pandemic, as if you didn't think his scholarly career was enough, uh, Russ became very involved in uh, the needs of so many people that were desperate um, suffering from depression and anxiety and could not afford what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy. Um, knowing that he could not uh, wait to act, Russ and his wife set up a foundation and started to purchase the equi equipment necessary to treat underserved populations. And that's when he formed the Compassion Neuroscience the first and only uh, TMS a nonprofit clinic, for vet, which is veteran-led and located in South Lake. Um, there he gives uh, treatments free of charge to all Gold Star family members, as well as those uh, soldiers and uh, others affected by this uh, disease. Compassion continues to be a hallmark of Russ's life as he actively supports his work in the DFW area, working with journalists who have, have to cover these uh, difficult uh, stories on uh, the children that have been slaughtered, you know, these uh, outrageous events of sniper shootings, institutional racism, and others. And I never thought until I talked to Russ about the effect this has on, um, I thought about it for first responders, but I had not thought about the impact of seeing this carnage on uh, people who are not supported and trained, which are journalists. In addition to that, he's uh, been actively involved with the AT&T Performing Arts Centers in their summer camps, teaching the neuroscience of kindness to children, and more importantly, um, and more recently, here at the Dallas Museum of Art, where he's come to be interested in and will share with, you, with us his insights on Matthew Wong. Russ has been inspired, I mean really inspired, by Matthew's work, um, and he was e wanted an opportunity to confront the stigma around artists who struggle with mental health because it is um, something that is grossly misunderstood and the neuroscience uh, in this area is important for us as lay people to uh, have a better understanding about. Uh, Matthew's show, The Realm of Appearances, at which I mentioned that um, has been so beautifully cu curated by Vivian Lee, uh, gives us a framework within, in a contemporary sense, to uh, look deeply at a single artist who unfortunately suffered from uh, various mental illnesses and invites a new understanding of how we can um, look at science and art and gain new insights into our lives. So with that, I want you to welcome uh, Russ Toll, and I hope that you will enjoy this evening with all of us tonight. And he will talk uh, for about uh, 45 minutes, and then there will be questions. So I hope you'll stay here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, and thank all of you for being here. I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, th this, this topic is, you know, we don't get the opportunity to, to join our two worlds that often. So tonight I want to accomplish uh, four things on our walk through the realm of appearances. Uh, the first is establishing a foundation for the perspective that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to use that perspective to see this art through a different lens and then uh, to, to go into the, the, the next phase, understand the basic workings of of the brain's networks and what that means in depression. And with that knowledge, as Bonnie was saying, we'll confront that stigma of mental health and understand that the myth of a tortured artist, is, that only a tortured artist can be a genius, is, is just that, a myth. Um, and then lastly, uh, 
as we leave, the, the last thing we want to do is empower, to, to make sure everyone here leaves with the knowledge and resources to be uh, an ally and help those in need and prevent another suicide. So, um, as Bonnie was letting you know, I am not an artist, and I am not an art expert, but that's uh, exactly why I'm excited about the discussion tonight. Uh, because it's dangerous to silo ourselves off, and we see that effect in the world around us. Um, and it's my hope that my unique dual citizenship as a veteran and neuroscientist can inspire you to consider uh, Matthew Wong's works from a different perspective. And as a dual citizen in several respects himself, uh, Matthew, brought to light uh, many unique facets from, from that very um, uncharacteristic experience that, on the journey he went through. So uh, in that spirit, I thought it'd be fun to, to start with that unique intersection that you might not be fully aware of, of art history and military history. So there's a, a film that a good number of folks have seen called The Monuments Men. And what that, that film describes is the Monuments Men and Women uh, foundation of some incredibly brave people uh, during World War II who were not professional warriors. They were painters and sculptors, curators, architects, and poets. And it was their job to safeguard and ransom back that which had been taken. As Hitler murdered millions, he stole their art and absconded with it to caves and salt mines with uh, the intent of keeping it for himself in a, in a very sick plot to, to have his own museum. But these men and women risked their lives not to rescue oil on canvas, but they were there to rescue uh, culture and the sacred achievements of humanity. Uh, they protected Michelangelo with sandbags. When the, you know, the, the bombings were occurring, they would risk their lives to make sure that that marble did not get chipped. Uh, they protected Da Vinci with carvings and if you're even somewhat familiar uh, with their history, there are still some names and vignettes that I think would surprise you. If you are familiar with the, the sculptures of Hancock or if you uh, know George Clooney's character in the movie, that is George Stout. The founder of the New York City Ballet was slinging the lead in the streets of Bavaria. And many of these heroes went on to, to run some of the most well-known institutions in the world. And uh, if there are any people here from the DMA's Art Restoration Department that will try to keep you from fainting, uh, as you see here, 19-year-old soldiers carrying masterpieces on their backs. It would just, I, I know there's a lot out there that are, you know, we talk about anxiety, and this is probably, <laughs> we need to move on from this. And then uh, the, the women uh, of this foundation, this operation too, they have remarkable stories that I wish we had more time uh, to delve into, but especially uh, Rose Vallon. Um, she is a, a, uh, an inspiration to anyone who can read more than four uh, sentences of her bio. She, um, she would risk her life every single day, and it's because of her efforts that um, a significant proportion of the museums in France have what they have. And this... Um, this gentleman on the right, Harry Edlinger, I, I really like his story because he had a grandpa, and grandpa in his house had a print of uh, that Rembrandt self-portrait. It's one of his most favorite works, so uh, he had got one from the store, hung it up whenever Harry would visit. He would see it, and he grew to, to love it as well, but he could never see it in person because the Jews weren't allowed in the museum. Um, but when war broke out, Harry uh, volunteered with the, uh, the Monuments Men, and through his actions, he became the, the guy who rescued the actual, original masterpiece of Rembrandt's self-portrait, and it was him who delivered it back in person to the museum that would not let him in. I thought that was just, oh, I love that. Um, but, you know, the, the, on face value, you, want, you ask yourself why, if you're running for your life, why would you have, you know, these, uh, these works, even if they... You can maybe understand Rembrandt or Da Vinci, but a lot of folks had had uh, articles of artwork on them that were, you know, sentimental only to within the family. Why would you risk your life for that? Um, but it wasn't uncommon for refugees to, to bring art and other treasured heirlooms with them as they fled. And, you know, you can kind of understand if you uh, uh, think about it for yourself. If your house was on fire 
and you knew everyone was out, no human life was in danger, but you had time to grab one item, what would you get? You can't say your iPhone. Yeah, I know what, what I would grab is the, uh, the, the, the portrait above our mantle of where Heidi and I got engaged, of the Rialto. It, it, is, it is sacred to me. And uh, what you would take with you is sadly a question that uh, I saw answered several times recently uh, near the Western Ukrainian border. There, you know, you hear a lot in the news about the, the reporters who are risking their lives, and they certainly are, but what you never hear about is those people in the red and white buses. Um, at, as soon as the sun goes down, they would sprint over the border, and these incredibly heroic drivers would scurry across and come back just before daybreak with a max capacity load of mothers and their children, uh, who were mostly daughters, is one of the, the sad things I saw consistently is that a lot of the sons stayed with dad. And under the watchful eyes of volunteers and the Polish police who, were, who did a, an honestly amazing job, um, you know, the, the families were able to catch their breath for a moment and the kids played or they tried to play, but what they did a lot was make art. And they made a lot of art. And so you can, you know, when you're trying to capture what's the importance of, of this expression, this medium, you'll never be able to, to say it, but you can feel it. And then uh, in a few of these volunteers, you know, some of them who gave me their permission to take their photograph, what I would see uh, consistently is this thousand yard stare that would start to creep in and take over their gaze. Um, and it, it wasn't just because they were exhausted, although they, they certainly were from making evacuation run after run at night, it's when that bus is coming back and the sun is coming up, the, the things that that young lady saw and what um, her compatriots saw it is something that, to a degree, I could relate to. And one of my, you know, we have DSM-4, DSM-5, these very sterile and clinical definitions of uh, PTSD, of anxiety, of depression, but it seems like the old stuff is the best stuff um, in, in a lot of these, these cases where old uh, Dr. Myers, uh, I think he, he hit the nail on the head with that one. So for that, you know, how can I relate to, to a certain extent to what uh, was being experienced by a whole lot of people over there? This is personal footage taken by myself and other soldiers in our unit. This is not a documentary crew. This is our stuff. And that's why the, the footage is kind of crappy is this is 2007 and, and the best you could get was a Canon Pixma or something. Um, but it, it is possible to, to catch a glimpse of the close calls and the heart pounding moments uh, even though we filtered out any clip that would contain blood. That's why a lot of veterans don't like driving near the curb. So I was struck by IEDs four times myself, and when these vehicles are destroyed in combat, there's an intelligence team that comes out with the rescue force to take pictures of the damage and gather materials in order to report the enemy's tactics and equipment to a higher headquarters, and that's where these images come from. I remember the first time showing this uh, to my mom, she was furious as, why, who is taking pictures? Why aren't they helping you? And the medic is with me, that there's, this is someone's job. Uh, so on March 5th, 2007, I was on a patrol in this tank when two anti-tank mines stacked on top of each other that made it about 18 inches to the left of my foot. And if, had been, if we had been in anything less than a tank, then Heidi would have been a 22-year-old widow. And that blast knocked me out along with my crew, punching a hole in the hole and flinging that 1,000-pound side skirt and road wheels uh, yards, hundreds of yards away. Uh, my wingman came back to rescue us before we could get ambushed, and that is me on the front slope of the tank with uh, my rifle and the medic working on me again to get us out of there, jet fuel pouring out onto the ground, creating a, a sense of urgency. Um, my, my driver's spine was, was broken in that incident, but uh, my gunner and I were okay, and we returned to duty two days later, and at this point, the deployment wasn't even halfway over. So that, that's the context to get, it wasn't awesome. 
But um, I was, was a very fortunate guy, and on day 433, made it back and got to see Heidi again. But that next job, as Bonnie said, was uh, the worst job I've ever had. And in fact, I, you can put it in a certain way that it's way easier to kick indoors than it is to knock on them. But during that duty, the, it's not just about you know knocking on, on the door and saying, um, Mrs. Smith, are you the mother of Private Smith, the Secretary of the Army, or Grace to inform you? Um, a lot of that time behind the scenes is at Walter Reed and Brooke Army Medical Center because I, you're not a doctor, but you're responsible for the administrative care of your, sol of your unit's uh, severely wounded soldiers. And it was that experience at, at Walter Reed especially that uh, I got to see firsthand. The hallways there in 2009 were um, lasting. And the doctors were great, the nurses were great, the, the people were great, the technology was awful from, from the, the experiences that I had. And being an engineer, I, uh, I decided to try and do something about it. You know, it's, it's a very frowned upon thing in the Army to complain without a solution to offer. So I uh, went to the colonel and I said, sir, I got a solution for you. Can you transfer me to the reserves? And uh, one thing led to another and there I am at Stanford. And it was the uh, most significant culture shock I've ever experienced. Because up until that point, my, uh, my most intelligent thought was tank go boom. And now I'm, I'm, I'm having to, to keep up with the smartest kids in the nation. But uh, again, luck smiled on me and I found a meet Edkin in his lab. Um, the NIH Pioneer Award winner, Amit Etkin, who led a lot of the development of TMS and EEG. As Bonnie said, TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial through the skull. A magnet is just a, a painless magnetic field, and when it contacts uh, axons in a certain way, it provides a stimulation. And in those pioneer days, I got to work on refining acquisition, doing analyses, and above all, I got to finally try out a beard, because you can't have it in active duty army. So I, I think I did it all right. Uh, Heidi vetoed it. I got it for six weeks. Um, but uh, my dear friend I, Irene and I, we refer to ourselves as the Stabler and Benson of neuroscience, and we ran the largest uh, veteran trial uh, up to that date of Iraq and Afghanistan vets. And there's a um, understanding that you'll never give an order to do something that you have not already done yourself. I was a test pilot for a lot of these and, and needed to make sure that the protocol was thoroughly tested before ever being applied to a fellow veteran. We got to see just what the limits of TMS were. I still cringe. But it, it, it is completely safe. I've been worried about it. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, the, the just wanting to help my, my fellow veterans wasn't the only motivation for studying neuroscience. I'd, I've always had a love for it because it is the most fascinating branch of science in my highly biased opinion. And that's made patently clear by um, investigating what happens in split brain patients. And these are folks who have had their corpus callosum severed as a last ditch effort um, for, severely, uh, for extremely severe epilepsy. So that's my brain. I, I have proof that I have one. Um, and in red is that corpus callosum, which is the interstate between the two hemispheres where the, uh, the vast, vast majority of interhemispheric communication happens. But when you remove that, some very astonishing and cool things happen. So uh, Dr. Gazaniga is the, the godfather of, of this work, and he worked with these split-brain patients and devised some of the most genius experiments ever, where um, basically you're able to ask a question independently to each hemisphere and let each hemisphere answer independently, and you get different answers. Uh, in this example, the patient was asked to pick up the object shown in the text. The left hemisphere sees what's on the right and sees the word ring, but cannot feel what is in the left hand. So they say ring anyway. As they saw in the text, they have speech, and that's what happens. The right hemisphere, who cannot speak, and is controlling the left arm, saw a key and picks that up. And that's where you have that discordance between, I can't see what's behind the screen, but I'm certain I'm holding a, uh, a key, but it's not. Um, but the, the best part about all this is the, the questions about identity. So when the experimenter asked the, patient, uh, asked the patient's left hemisphere 
what your name is. That's where speech is, so the patient said Paul. And then when they asked the right hemisphere, what is your name, the right hemisphere can't speak, but it can move the left arm. And the only way you can get an answer is Scrabble. So they asked old right hemisphere, what is your name? And Paul watched his left hand move without his volition and get four tiles, P-A-U-L. And it kind of, as you would expect, uh, astonished him. But the best part about this experiment is um, Paul was asked, what did you want to be when you grew up to the left hemisphere? And he said, a draftsman. And when they, at, or the experimenter asked his right hemisphere, what did you want to be when you grew up? That left hand started moving again. And that's what he spelled. <laughs> so the, what was so key about this is that there was nothing, there was no psychiatric disease with Paul. That, that what I really want you to take home is that this will happen to you or me if, if we had to get our corpus callosum severed. And there are questions in your head that you do not know the answer to. You do not know what Scrabble tiles you would grab. And it's, a, uh, it's an interesting thing to reflect on. And also reflecting on what does that mean for this art and science intersection. That it is um, key to get from these experiments that our feeling of art, our experience of art, is a synthesis of perceptions and emotions into a conscious moment. And we do that because our hardware is intact. That uh, going across a corpus callosum, those sensory um, signals are integrating with your memories and you have that art experience. But if you're able to interrupt it, as is in the case of these, uh, these rare split brain patients, you can see just how dependent we are on a orchestra that we don't ever perceive really. And uh, to really hammer on the uh, importance of synthesizing art and science into one uh, aggregate human endeavor, I think it is best captured by the Apollo program which is, in my opinion, humanity's greatest scientific achievement of, of landing on the moon. And the, the Webster, Oxford, et cetera definition is really consistent across whatever sources you use because science is science. That, that there's a pretty black and white job description if you want to come on over to, to UT and do experiments. Yet you measure, observe, and repeat. That's the game. But there is a more succinct way to say that and it's how you reach for the stars. That is your, your science, your tech, your engineering, all the, all the non-vowels in STEAM. But art is critically why we reach. And what you're looking at here is the first extraterrestrial sculpture on exhibit in the cosmos. And it's a poignant memorial uh, for the astronauts and cosmonauts who uh, perished in the name of exploration. And what it's even further distilled to here is humans honoring humans. And it's that feeling that you know well, um, but you have great difficulty putting into words, just like I am here. And the PBS has a, a show when I was doing the research for this a channel called The Art Assignment, and I absolutely fell in love with that channel. It is very cool. Um, and the definitions in one of those episodes are what you'll see here. That, that's the best one. And it's that, that last one that I think is, if I, if I had to pick one, that we're running out of ink and only one can go in the books, number six is what we're gonna write. And countless artists have been inspired by this same yearning, and uh, these are a few favorites. Uh, when Dreams Are Born was put on exhibition on the Mir Space Station, that's the, the, the top center one, the first art exhibit to, to fly in outer space. And I never knew that, that Georgia O'Keeffe um, took a crack at, at her interpretation of, of this same, the same feeling, and it, it was uh, a neat discovery for me personally. And not restricted to oil on canvas, but uh, photography, in my opinion, uh, can best capture the essence of both art and science in one profound moment. And here you see the only photograph of every human being that has ever lived or ever will live, except one. And that's the photographer himself, in this case, Michael Collins, watching Armstrong and Aldrin descend. So 
So finally, we're back to Matthew. Matthew Wong uh, recognized this power of the photograph, and now you can kind of uh, appreciate that art through this different lens of science. Those three moms uh, are, are what we're gonna explore next, and his earliest works were candid photographs taken on the street, and I don't think it was an accident that he, uh, he was inspired by this particular shot. The reason I think that is, you know, one of the, the quotes I found of his in, in researching this, this work is whether he was aware of it or not, um, I think that was more effective than a mirror uh, to him to, to see what he was really experiencing. And this is a, another inspiring photo I found of mother and child. The reason that is so grainy is because it was taken in the 70s and inscribed upon a gold record and shot in space. This is our representation. This is our, uh, our ambassador to the stars. If that is ever discovered and we had to pick what is going to represent our species, you'll find her on that record outside the solar system. And this final one is, is what is the best uh, representative of that intersection between the two worlds. And that quote is, is from Matthew himself. That, that's what he was seeking and trying to approach. And I think that this work by uh, Dr. Sachs at MIT, when she just had her son, she went to the scanner and produced um, an artifact of science and one of the best works of art I think there is. So, I mean, you can, you can give the sterile description of what that is as a neuroscientist. It's a, a T1-weighted image. You're looking at the relaxation times of different concentrations of protons, but, you know, what you feel is something far beyond that. What, what you're looking at is that, that, that's what a mother's love looks like in, in the, the most uh, complete representation of it. And Matthew continued this work um, as he you know, turned from photography into what, what was his real forte in, in, uh, in Canvas. And why I selected uh, these two, Landscape with Mother and Child, it, it follows naturally from what we were just looking at, and that, that powerful message of, of the, the, the mom and baby. But what's even more important about this work is that you're looking at works, plural. That underneath this is a piece called Untitled and a piece that is thought to be called The River. And he was constantly reusing canvases where he was painting with such a ferocity and a tempo that it was a logistical issue for one and it was a, um, a personal decision that if the work didn't meet the bar, it went back. And why I think that is such a... Um, a transferable lesson in, into the world of neuroscience is that it is how the brain paints itself. And you see it again in, uh, in the DMA's uh, uh, collection here with the West. And this is a, a work that, again, um, using X-ray techniques and, and other ways to inspect that, you know, that, to, to quote him himself, that if Matthew felt it was not up to scratch with the majority of stuff that sticks around, then it would get painted right over. And what I, I really loved about the story of, of this work is, as far as I know, that once an artist completes um, a piece, especially for a museum that's going to acquire it, it's done for a long time. But when the, the DMA acquired this one, it was still wet, because he was touching it up in the booth before it came over. And I, I you know, as a, a struggling uh, faculty member, I, I like, that, that was a moment of connection b b between us where the, the, the work is never done. Like, just sign one more thing. Um, but what, what's, uh, what brings us back to neuroscience is those, those areas throughout um, the, the canvas and the, the feelings that they at least created in me with the, the West, that, that's the feeling I had in a 2010 Civic headed out to California, hoping that I could save my friends, that it was a, a long road with a big sky and 
a lot of apprehension about where that path met the horizon. But when he was painting over the same canvas and over the same canvas again and again, what that also struck me as is that's what is going on in your brain at this very moment, that the brain paints wet on wet. Um, that is how it is constantly adapting and how the plastic nature of the brain takes the, you know, the canvas of your axons and imprints on it the nature of you. And what really represents that well, I think, is on, on the left, you're familiar with those neurons and axons colored in different coatings depending on where they're headed and where they're going. Um, on the right is applying the same coloring to those canvases under a microscopic examination. So a lot of those structures, they're, they're more rigid and they're straighter on the canvas side, but that intertwining of them and the way they represent the various nodes, what you're looking at is two different types of canvas and they're both painted on wet on wet. And from uh, into 2018, when serious mode was really starting to, to grasp him, um, that is where we get the, the painting that is the, the name of the exhibit, The Realm of Appearances. And when I first looked at that, I felt a very um, Shel Silverstein vibe of where the wild things are and, and all those other books from, from growing up where at that first glance, it is, a, it is chaos, what, what is happening on that, on, on that canvas. And that chaos feeling sticks around for about a minute. And then you get, start to see the order. And that, that quote that, he is a, um, that is attributed to him on the left is something that I think he achieved his goal where he would have no idea that this, this vet neuroscientist guy um, a few years hence would connect with it as a math nerd. So don't worry, there's no quiz. All I want you to get from this is that equation is real simple. There's X and there's R. There, there's two values. And in this logistic equation, um, you run those numbers and you plot those points with a real simple formula. And what you get at the end is Mandelbrot fractals, where at the end of this, you see some of the most elegant um, shapes generated by nature itself. And it, it is, this, this is, you know, uh, the, the church of math, at, as it were. This is where you can just see the absolute elegance in, in the, the design of our, our universe around us. So remember, what you're looking at there, two little variables. What I want you to get from this is that amazing chaos, those fractals that repeat forever, they came from a pretty ordered equation. Chaos comes from order. And the opposite is true as well. You can get um, order from chaos. These are the prime numbers uh, removed from an Archimedean spiral. So all you need to, to really get here is that once you remove the primes, different patterns at massive scales repeat and repeat out ad, ad infinitum, and that beautiful design you get is a, uh, a representation of order that was beget by complete chaos, by absolute randomness. And when you combine these two, um, one of the, the repeating truths of nature I find is that these patterns repeat on grand scales, that those intersections just seem to fit nicely. Uh, does anyone know what that diagram is? that it's a, it's a map of where you live. That also was on those um, spacecraft shot out. They are the points to various quasars that have very unique repeating patterns. And if you had to give an alien your address, you know, that they, they wouldn't know that I'm in Keller, but they would recognize those 14 distinctly beating quasars and know where they intersect and see, uh, you know, um, John and Jane waving at them. And so the, those patterns at, at massive repeating scales here, um, and it, it's hard to tell in this picture where the axons are, but the axons are on the left, and if you change the color scale, you can see our galactic supercluster, that those, these patterns and, and the, the way they intersect, they are at the macroscopic and they are at the unfathomably large scale. Tracks in the brain, these axons, remember those highways that connect different parts to other parts? 
you see uh, some of those same patterns that are the same at a few centimeters and also happen to, you know, they fit general shapes of, uh, of things much more massive. You're looking at, at Lanakea here. That is our, our local supercluster that is millions of light years long with hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And if, uh, if you are any other fellow neuroscientists out there, that, uh, that it's the super marginal gyrus, right? Up, up in the, the top left. And those are structural patterns that, that you see repeat, but there's also these functional patterns that are all around you um, in nature that I believe Matthew began to pick up on. And there's a, a certain time frame in June where when the sun goes down and you're in the dark forest, the lightning bugs come out. And it is pretty, but it is very well defined as well. That what you're looking at begins as random, um, random signaling, but quickly harmonizes into those beats. That beat that you see there, those waves of one to two hertz, those cycles per second, they're carrying a message. And that message varies from species to species, but um, it, it usually is a you up kind of, kind of thing for the, the, the forest. But it is it's just strikingly beautiful and strikingly similar to that other forest that is experiencing that, that same um, harmony within you right now. And that, that is what I, I thought of, that forest, is when I saw Blue Rain, um, that's what clicked for me, that uh, it, was, it was the fireflies in the forest, but the rain was too heavy for them to fly. And that, this is where we see that tipping point um, where, where Matthew was, was struggling significantly with, with uh, the issues in his life. And a critic at, at the, the, this blue art show it said that uh, he has an uncanny ability to activate nostalgia, both personal and collective. And some of that collective nostalgia was activated in me. And I also found it interesting that that was the, uh, the original diagnosis of PTSD in World War I, nostalgia. And you can see the, the challenges here uh, that he's rescuing with become stronger. As I said, there's, um, it's too, the rain is too intense for the fireflies to come up, but there's still hope calling in that light in the cabin. And this is where um, I think it would be informative to explore the neuroscience of depression briefly to see what the brain experiences, what might his brain have been ex experiencing. And in order to do that, we have to get these connectivity principles of how the brain's wired. And that activity happened in the brain that's incredibly fast. And EEG can detect it because it can sample thousands of times per second. And what you're looking at here is the activity in those EEG electrodes. When you see someone wearing that, that cap, that's what picks up those fluctuations in the voltage on the head. And this is a person chilling out in a chair. This is resting state. That's what's going on with you right now. And when you see that, uh, that activity slow down by 10 times, it's like looking at a rolling pot of boiling water, that that is how your thoughts occur. They roll back and forth in these oscillations 10 times per second. And when you take that activity at the scalp and you interpolate it down to the brain where we, we do uh, most of our analyses at, at UT, that's how we're starting to be able to say brain region A is connected to brain region B by this much. Um, and we accomplished that a lot like geologists tell you where an earthquake came from that those electrodes are like seismometers. We pick up the phase delay, do the math, and we're able to say that activity came from this area. And it's also how newborn babies get their first hearing test. You, uh, if you have been in, in, a, in a hospital in, in modern times with, uh, with a newborn baby, they, they play this, uh, a sound, but you can't ask the kid to raise, raise their hand. So they use three little electrodes, they play the sound and see if there was any activity in the auditory cortex. Um, but we, we want to get this to a resolution where it's useful, where we're able to measure and say, um, you know, we, we're able to, to give you an intervention to help you get better using actual data to guide us. And understanding how those networks work, like it's, it's hard, it took me 10 years to get, you know, functional network connectivity. So to, to expect you to get in 10 seconds is a bit much. So we'll, you're already familiar with it though and don't know it. it it's uh, air traffic is very, very similar. Uh, what you're looking at is pre-COVID, a day's worth of air traffic. That uh, 
the black curve when night falls. You can see how activity decreases as everyone goes home, the sun comes up, everyone gets on their flights. Um, what you can gather from this, though, that's a lot how the brain works, that there's one slow wave that regulates activity across the entire global pattern, and that as the, the ranges increase, the, the frequency goes down. So New York to London, there's a lot fewer flights than there is uh, Dallas to Chicago. So local connectivity is fast, and distant connectivity is slower. And different parts of the brain connect to other different parts of the brain in specific frequencies. That's what gives us those functional networks. That's how we're able to say this is network A and this is network B. So you're looking at an airplane network A that you probably um, wouldn't recognize at first. Every single day, a whole bunch of planes leave Memphis, they go to where they're going, a lot of them go to Oakland, and then they come back. And that's not Delta, it's not American. What do you think it is? FedEx, that's right. So there's different areas of the country that are um, uniquely connected at different frequencies to accomplish a specific, specific task. That's exactly how the brain works. You're looking at a functional cognitive network. And then here's depression. So you're looking at uh, one month into the pandemic, as it slides back and forth, you can see where the great differences in air travel were. Um, and where, what you can pull from this is the most significantly affected, the most depressed uh, network connectivity that uh, resulted from COVID was in those international flights. So New York to London went down a lot. Uh, Paris to, to Sydney went down a lot. Dallas to Chicago went down some, but not nearly as much. So local connectivity is preserved, but that long range uh, connectivity was the first to go. So instead of COVID, imagine that this happened because of a jet fuel shortage. There's not enough JPA to go around. So which flights do you cancel first? I'm not gonna bring up the Southwest thing. Um, but the long range flights get the ax first because they require the most fuel. Now, what happens in the brain when there's not enough dopamine to go around, not enough serotonin to go around? Which connections get the ax first? The long range ones. Which connections do you need to do those tasks that are most human? To, to be interested in your hobbies, to interact with the people around you, those long range connections that are the foundation of our functional networks. So now that we get that, here's the map. This is the counties of the brain. Um, and to keep it simple, we have seven of these networks and they, they do basic functions. Visual, self-explanatory, motor is what moves your uh, limbs and then the rest are very critical to the things that make us human and separate us from other mammals. But we're gonna look at just three. The three that are most important for depression, for anxiety, um, and for PTSD. And that is the salience. As the name applies, that network helps you assign value to the things that you're interested in. If you, um, the, the hobbies you have, do you wanna spend time with your significant other? Do you, what do you, um, basically give motivation points to. Executive control, as the name implies, that's doing a task, that's speaking to a bunch of people, that is doing math, that is driving your car. Default is introspection, that is daydreaming, chilling on the couch, thinking of how the day went, thinking about your plans for tomorrow. Um, but in these networks, that's how they're supposed to work. But we can measure them with EEG, with MRI, and see when things are not what they're supposed to be. So if you are depressed, if those networks are not, um, those long range connections aren't happening, salience network, you expect that connectivity to go down. And you see that. And the executive control network, you can't get out of bed, you're depressed, you're, you, um, you're having difficulty staying focused or assigning attention. You expect connectivity and executive to be down, and it is. What do you think about default mode? It's the opposite, that you're locked in, you're ruminating, you are focused and in that rut that you can't get out of, of those, those negative thoughts. And that is how that manifests. So that is, that's the, the empirical measurement. That's the volts don't lie, picking up the, the, uh, the result of what depression, anxiety, et cetera, can do. It's the opposite in PTSD. The salience network would be hyper-connected because everything's important. What was that? You knocked on the door. Did you hear something? You're standing too close. That hypervigilance is how that manifests. So we're able to 
this is a powerful tool because now it's a mechanical problem that we have a mechanical solution for. It's not, the, it's not a stigma anymore. We're, we're back in the realm of a busted knee. It is nothing to, um, to be so um, obsessed with. Now, at, as you can understand, those networks are connected in unhealthy ways in those disorders I mentioned. And it's, uh, it's not enough to just you know, describe it and leave it at that because it is a much more visceral thing if you've experienced yourself or you know, someone you love is going through this. So in, the, uh, in that 2009 timeframe, that, that is where it was the worst for me. And it's important to, to, to talk about it and, and how that, that built up and how it felt because I was, I was getting numb. Um, you know, that, that hole in that door and that Humvee, that's where a rocket came through and took the face off of a guy that I was very close with. He lived. Um, in fact, he, he was rehabilitated at, uh, at Walter Reed, got some plastic surgery, and was back in another truck about six months later. That's, you know, the quality of, of soldier I had the honor to lead. I was also tired of seeing little girls get shot. Um, you know, that a bullet ricochet went through this, this sweet girl's ankle. And what, um, what affected me the most about it was that she never cried. That, you know, with, with my kids, you know, he's touching me, he's standing too close. And it, it always, it, it goes off, but it just broke my heart of what did you go through to where you can get shot in the ankle as a little girl and not have one tear. And then the, the worst of it, as you can expect, is burying my friends and telling moms that uh, he's not coming home. So it is, um, again, difficult to put into words. So what I thought I'd, I'd use is a metaphor next to, to describe the, the point at which it became the worst. So it is talking about suicide uh, coming up next, and this is a little jarring. Sink rate, 2,500. Increase climb, increase climb, climb, climb now. One thousand, too low, terrain, 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 terrain. Pull up, pull up, 500. Pull up, pull up, pull up, 400. Pull up, pull. Up. pull. So that is the, the best metaphor I have for you, for what that inner monologue uh, feels like. And I, I wrestled with whether to use a, um, a, a clip from an, an actual crash, because that's the, the feeling of impending doom, where I, I hear the alarms. I, I know I'm supposed to pull up. I just don't have enough strength to pull back on the stick. Um, and, and just so you know, uh, for that clip, that was... I added all the, the alarms post hoc. I didn't think it was ethical to use actual crash footage. So that was just a, a bumpy ride for some experienced pilots who did a fine job getting it down. But what I want you to, to take from that is that, um, you know, that, that helplessness feeling where you can't see out the window and you know that bad things are in the immediate future and you just don't know what to do. Um, and a lot of folks have had that happen to them. And it's one of, the, um, one of the, the less terrible things about suicide is that it's an equal opportunity destroyer. That uh, every one of these human beings that you see have very little apparent overlap. But being human is enough that suicide doesn't care if you're young or old, doesn't care about your sex, it doesn't care that you're hilarious, successful, promising, beautiful, tough, um, it doesn't care that you're you know, exuberant, doesn't care that you're talented, adventuring, doesn't care if you're barrier breaking, and it certainly doesn't care if you are among the bravest warriors that the U.S. Army has ever known. So what do they have in common then? They're all human beings with a human brain. That is the common thread here, that they are um, living the human experience with the human body using a machine that is so exquisite in its design, but so, so vulnerable. And fortunately, um, and I, I'm proud to be a, a part of this effort that science is getting us there finally, uh, allowing us to make significant headway in how we save that art and save the artist. 
What you're looking at here is a map of 250 depressed folks who came through UT Southwestern. These are folks who got better. Their depressive symptoms went down. Why was that? That is key information to know. So those blue areas, those are areas that changed. That's where connectivity went down. Guess what those areas are? Those are areas of the default mode. Rumination went down. Being stuck in negative thoughts went down. The areas in red are the areas that increase in connectivity. Those areas are areas for the executive control, for the salience network. You're better able to assign value. You're better able to accomplish tasks. So now we can use the measurements. But instead of giving you a questionnaire and asking you how much sleep you got, I can ask the volts when the volts don't lie. And with this information, the next step is to go into TMS and go into full scientist mode and do this interrogation and this exploration and see what those networks are doing and what effects we can have on them to get these people better. So if you've never seen TMS before, here's what it looks like. And a, a volunteer buddy of mine. Yes, it does sound like a machine gun, but it is painless. And what you're looking at in that cap whether you can tell it or not, is extraordinary. So once that beat is done, look at that, that rolling, broiling red and blue back and forth happens again. And now I'm able to measure. I'm able to measure pulse by pulse. Did we make the network change the way it was supposed to? Did we go in the right direction or do we need to change? And this is the very cutting edge of, of this technology. This, this is work that um, it's not even published yet. And we're, we're already familiar in, in how to do rehab. That, that uh, the woman you saw on the treadmill, those legs are moving at different speeds. That's a split treadmill because she had a stroke and she was relearning how to walk. So how do you do that? You, uh, you take that weaker leg and make it go faster. And in the, the same way, we take this aberrant network, the network that needs this connectivity change, and change it. It is, uh, it, you know, it, it's far more complex, but a way to put it is rehab for the brain. So that uh, Colonel Posnick, one of the, the best uh, officers I've ever been around on the right, he, uh, he fell to suicide and that affected us, as you can uh, imagine, significantly, but even more so, because it is, it's not supposed to happen to officers, it's not supposed to happen to leaders. And speaking of leaders, this is one of the best uh, field commanders I've ever had, Colonel Goins was our battalion commander. And in the train up to Iraq, he would take us on runs um, and ask us tactical questions. The point being is to quiz you when you are exhausted, to, to, to help you be able to make the right call when things are um, austere. And one of the, the questions that he asked us over and over and over again is, young lieutenant, what's the most powerful weapon you have at your disposal? And Lieutenants, being lieutenants, always get it wrong. Is it the Claymore mine, sir? Is it the, the 120 millimeter cannon? Is it the carbine um, or cluster bomb? And the, the answer we'd always give us time and again is that you are entrusted with the most powerful weapon in the platoon because you're the one who can call for help. And that is the, the lesson that I really would like to convey to folks that you have the most powerful weapon at your disposal, the most powerful asset that you can activate at any time because there are problems that you cannot handle. There are problems that are beyond your scope, beyond my scope, that would overwhelm any one of us. But you can call the radio and help will be, be there. The cavalry will come. So AFSP, I'm very excited to work with them as well because at, at UT, we're, uh, we're closing in on 60 participants in um, suicidal youth who I have EEG on now, and I am mining and mining away to, towards getting us to an intervention that we can do far beyond before that, uh, that plane starts to descend uncontrollably. And uh, these different organizations are, are all um, contributing in interlocking ways that, that, uh, that fill the gaps that each one can't do on its own. So you have the science nerds like me or at UT doing our thing and getting the, the, uh, the science to get to the cure. AFSP is always there. Please remember that that is your radio, that 988 
we'll get to cavalry. And uh, Grant Halliburton, what I'm, uh, one of the programs I didn't know they, they did um, is the, the dad's program. So the, I'm, I'm excited about that because that is, of all the jobs I've ever had, that's job number one. It's the one that uh, I love the most and it's the one that, that dictates the way everything else will go. So, uh, you know, to, to wrap things up here, I understand that it, it's easy to hear, this is the number, now go be a hero. Um, being a hero is, it is a, a difficult thing. So, you know, all too often we get, um, you know, the, the definition, and it's usually a swole dude with a bunch of ribbons um, and a machine gun usually, but that is, from what I have I've gathered through a lot of firsthand experience, heroes never look the way you imagine them. That's what a hero looks like. That is the meanest woman in Iraq. Um, and uh, she, she lives in a place called Al Qaeda, and Al Qaeda rolled in um, in the early months of 2007 and said, here's the thing, you will not educate any girls in this town. If you do so, you'll be summarily executed in the town square. So I, I got there a few days later. I, I talked to her, and her message to me was, I'm the principal, all half were teachers. I need you uh, to get me desks and a couple tanks. And I said, okay, just don't hit me. <laughs> and we did that. And you know, just think of the audacity it takes, the uh, defiance it takes to, to do such a thing, that that woman in blue, that, that's the face of a hero. I want you to know that that's what it looks like, that as a teacher, you know, teaching at the level that, that requires a Medal of Honor type commitment. And those are the kids in the back unloading desks, because I'm not gonna do it. Um, but when, once they, they got all set up, that is what victory looks like. And it's those victories that you'll never see on the news, and it's a, um, a similar thing in a lot of different worlds. That's the way it is for, again, the, the science nerds, that what we see that is gonna change the world, we see it at 2.30 in the morning after the 900th run of this algorithm and trying to make it better, trying to make it better. And I can tell you that that feeling of the aha moment when you're the first person to ever see what the cure looks like, it is the, the feeling of saving Christmas. And so that feeling that I've seen from heroes like the teachers of al Qaeda and, and the heroes in Ukraine and all the amazing people I've had the honor of associating with, um, here's one more. That's uh, Colonel Sumwa, who is one of the first female paratroopers and uh, my commander for several of those casualty missions. And she's uh, one of the best officers you'll ever meet. I'd follow her anywhere. And that's why she was the first name that came up after the pandemic when I said I... It is, we cannot, I would like to wait. I would like the situation to be better financially, et cetera, et cetera, but um, we must attack and we have to go now. So she was the first call I made and said, hey ma'am, I gotta, I'm gonna do this nonprofit. I need three people, are you down? And she said yes. And so we, uh, that is how Compassion Neuroscience was born a few months ago. And this is the, the other heroic woman involved in that effort. That is the, uh, the back of a woman who trusted me enough to turn your launch keys on three and watch all of our life savings be converted into five crates on the right. And that is the, the seed that created the first TMS uh, nonprofit clinic there is. And if you, you know, remember some slides back where Susie Veloza, the, the mother of Jake, um, you know, the, I, I watched her and I watched Bob, uh, her husband, come millimeters within the end. It was one of the, the, the toughest things I've ever had to do. And trying to get her help at the VA was pulling teeth. And I'm not mad at the VA about that because its mission since the 1800s has been to care for him who, has, uh, who shall have borne the battle, his widow and his orphan. Doesn't say anything in there about parents. Doesn't say anything about your siblings or your significant others. And so that's the gap that, that we are here to solve. So. Um, it is the only, and, and Susie was patient number one. I have her permission for the photo. And the, it was, you know, that, that look as I'm, I'm seeing her thumb twitch to, to do the TMS right, there's also a, a lot of pride in that and, you know, keeping a promise I made to Jake. Um, and so we are, we're in the first few months and I tell you, if you want to uh, start a TMS clinic, man, it is, Talk to me later, because you're going to need some help. And I have needed a lot of help, but there's 
again, the, the heroes you least expect uh, spring up. Like uh, a lot of colleagues, uh, Russell Mitchell of Heading Health is one, a lot of mentors have shown up and have coached me through this, where they recognize the, the, the value in what we're trying to do. And, and I, I'm very, very appreciative of all the help I've gotten. And it's, I'm going to see this through to where we get enough um, resources to move from seeing a dozen patients right now to I want to see more than 100 by the end of the year. And once we're at that point and have the website, the EMR, all the good stuff, we can, uh, we can start talking about numbers that have commas in them. And, and so to, to, to close that, that, that arc of going through that, that world of art, that world of science, that this is one of the last paintings you'll see at, at Matthew Wong's exhibit, and it hits everyone in a different way. Um, and it was the, the one that I had the hardest time deciphering personally of, of what are you actually seeing. So, you know, I, I've listened to people. I, I was sat on the bench and, and eavesdropped on the conversations in the gallery of what, what people experience here. And the, the majority of the time is resignation. It's, it's, um, it is pity. It is the, what could have been. But there's, you know, all of that it is centered on that white. The white in the middle, the uncrossable expanse. But I have seen clouds like that before, and those clouds were fog. They were only a few feet deep. The, when I when I look at see you on the other side, um, I, I see someone gathering the strength to take a step into a place they can't see, and having the faith to know that they're only going to go down a couple inches. And there, under that white, there is solid ground, and there's a path all the way across. So. I uh, thank you very, very much for spending the evening with me. I hope you, uh, you got to experience a little bit of default mode and functional cognitive networks without, without, uh, without having your eyes bleed. But I would I'd, uh, love to answer any questions you might have now, and I can't thank you enough for showing up. Thanks. If you have a question for Dr. Toll, please raise your hand and I will come around with a mic. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your service. Oh, thank you, sir. We have a remarkable in common. I <laughs> served at Walter Reed. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm a neuroradiologist. I served 10 years in the military. U.S. Army, um, and I did see some young men and women take their lives. Mm -hmm. um, I am fascinated by this particular aspect of neurosciences. I'm more familiar with DTI imaging, yep. uh, which is looks like it's the infant. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> it has is. a pathway. We as citizens, mm -hmm. how can we help you? Um, you know, I'll, I'll put in the selfless plug for if you can send 20 bucks to Compassion Neuroscience, I'd appreciate it. But in the bigger picture is NIH. Because right now, um, we are we're at the beginning of a tidal wave where you haven't begun to see the effects of the pandemic. That the, um, some of those are slow burning fuses on, on what they're gonna manifest as. And it's not just depression, it's not just anxiety and PTSD. Right now we are about 50 patients deep at uh, at the CDRC at UT in addiction. We have folks in that TMS chair addicted to cocaine, addicted to methamphetamine. And it's another study that I am um, very proud of because it's the first of its kind. No one has ever tried TMS in addiction because no one has ever cared. I mean, that, you know, people care to an extent, but when we have postpartum and we have cancer and we have a long list of deserving people who need help that it is um, oftentimes the, the, the people fall into addiction that are, you know, you're, you'll be seen last. And that, that, is the, uh, that is a nexus where, you know, a, a compassionate approach can do the most good. So in, instead of, um, you know, one of the, the most important things to give back to these people is their dignity. It, it, you know, it's not just about the, the screenings and, and the methadone, et cetera. You, you're made to, to be felt very inhuman to, to jump through the hoops necessary for that. And if you could just come to the clinic and TMS, if it can do the intervention we think it can, then we can, you know, that uh, the, 
opioid epidemic and, and all the, the ancillary um, related issues that we hear of, we can not just put a dent in it, we can put a kill shot on that and, and get it before it becomes a wildfire out of control. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this whole program. It's been really uh, interesting to me. And I have a question about, um, I have a 12-year-old granddaughter that is suffering from depression. Mm -hmm. And she's very young, though, and yeah. they usually don't address that with someone so young. And I'm wondering about this. Um, can she be, she doesn't live here, she lives in Boston, but can she be a subject for TMS and does she have to come down here and get that helmet? And oh, I'm, I'm sure curious there, there's, about all that. Yeah, there, there, there's, uh, Texas is not the only place for TMS. It, it is very much nationally distributed. And at UT, we'll, uh, we can enroll participants in, in those longitudinal studies down to 10 years old. But there, it is, it's a difficult, um, it is even a greater challenge at that age because it is difficult to say adolescent depression and adult depression are pretty well established, but that prepubescent, it is a, um, it is chaos on chaos of, of what is the root cause uh, of this. And uh, it, you have to be so, so careful um, with, with working in that population. And the way, what I would say to you is that the, the assets are not exclusively here. They're, they're definitely, all across the nation, so a, a psychiatrist would be best able to answer that. But it, it, you know, to your point of of difficult questions, when I had a close friend at work today, you know, saying, "How's your talk going to go?" and um, I was giving her the lowdown, and she one of her most candid questions uh, for me. And you always get the best questions, you know, in, in back where, where no one sees. And she asked me if someone is really set on killing themselves, is there really anything you can do? Um, and you know, I, I uh, always want to answer truthfully, and the truthful answer is yes. It, of course, it's not 100%, but the, um, there, there is that feeling among a lot of folks that once the decision's made, it's been made. But it, uh, that, that is absolutely not the case. You know, for certain individuals in certain situations, yeah, the, the, the die is cast. But uh, for the, the majority, I think the vast majority, intervention is is absolutely viable. Um, so you discussed the patterns and the overall slowdown of what's going on neurologically. I'm not STEM of any kind, mm -hmm. but- um, I'm not an artist, we're the artist <laughs> over here. <laughs> um, but so like, I appreciate the discussion of the slowdown in the context mm -hmm. of PTSD, right. but to your point about the beginning of the tidal wave of occurring with the pandemic, there's yeah. also a lot more depression, anxiety, mental illness in um, kids, to your point as well. Is mm -hmm. there any indication of what could be causing that slowdown? I mean, that might be a yeah. huge question, but just in terms of the increase that we've seen overall. Right, and, and the, the, you, know, you want to find what's the thing we should measure to, to get um, in anticipation of the storm. So I asked, you know, my medical doctor buddies, uh, what have y'all seen uh, through the pandemic? What's been the, the, the most striking thing that surprised you the most? And the answer I get time and again is liver panels. That, that is the, the finger on the pulse of the, the, the population where it, it gives you an indication of things are bad and things are getting worse. Um, you can, sort of tie that to a spike in prescriptions for, for antidepressant, but I, I don't buy into that. I think that's a good sign that, that what you're actually seeing is more people accessing care um, in, in, that, in that circumstance. So you're, the, the question of how do you know when's it coming and how bad is it gonna be? The, those metrics are hotly debated among, among the, the, the scientists, but the, the ones that are most reliable are the ones that we've been running for a century. And uh, that liver panel is, is a good, good way to, to see it.
Hi, thank you so much for sharing your work and for your passion. Um, I have a question. Do the, does the imaging show a difference between uh, PTSD related to one-time trauma, like an armed robbery, yeah. versus like continual trauma and desensitization, like mm -hmm. repeat combat tours, and what is that difference? Yep, yeah, the, the most striking difference you get is combat trauma, which is your blast trauma, the IEDs, um, and then the other variety is military sexual trauma. Or, and, and that's, that is um, just restricted to data. I was able to get the VA. So, you know, obviously that is a non-representative sample of the population at large. But the, the general question of can you detect subtypes of, of PTSD, it is definitively yes. Um, I'm very much on the fence for TBI because no no two injury, a traumatic brain injury. There's, there are no two insults are ever the same. But what what I've seen from the neuroimaging of of PTSD and of other disorders, it, it is re, remarkably consistent. And the the thing that is uh, most powerful about the data set we have at UT is it's longitudinal, which means that you uh, we've seen the same person time and again. And it's a naturalistic study, which means we're not giving you any medications. I am, I am my favorite scientist. I am Jane Goodall in the trees watching the apes um, and, and learning what I can learn over time but of what that, that behavior does. So what we have is one person who has depression, a history of depression, that has been in and out of episodes, getting whatever treatment they get. We've been seeing them since 2016, and we saw them through the pandemic and we've seen 965 of them. So that, that amount of data over that amount of time, that, that is where the, the real value in this is because it is so difficult to compare me to you um, and, and control for all the things that, that make us different of life experience and other demographics. But when we're in the same human being, when you're looking at me at 15 different time points, when, when I, I look at those EEGs, what, uh, what gets me the most is how ridiculously consistent they are, like um, fingerprint level, where you don't need a supercomputer to do the sorting, you can sort it by eye. If, if I give you, um, you know, three EEGs from 10 different people, and you have 30 of them in front of you, you can sort them by your own eye of who is who and get a near perfect assessment. So the, all that is to say is, we really should be using this a lot more as a measurement instead of um, the, the more vague and traditional ways, such as a questionnaire of how does this make you feel? And, and just one more thing to, to touch on your question before of, of the, the wave coming. Um, it is coming in, you know, surprise, surprise, it doesn't affect everyone in socioeconomic ranks the same. And where you're seeing it the most is in, um, you know, the persons of color and single moms especially. And this is where TMS has an opportunity that is never had before um, in the world of depression. Because if you are, um, a single mom, you likely don't have top of the line health insurance, you know, the Blue Cross or Aetna. And if you're a brand new uh, single mom and you're breastfeeding, you're uh, much more hesitant to, to try uh, antidepressants or any medication, let alone like aspirin. So this is the, the best opportunity that, in uh, my opinion, to do real lasting good at generational levels is the, the ability to give a very um, effective intervention, you know, remission rates of 60% and higher in, in a cohort um, that can never access it before and cannot affect baby. Like, we, we, could, we could save Christmas, man. There's thousands of lives we could save. Uh, thanks for your talk and uh, thanks for your service. Um, so I guess I was wondering, uh, do you have, you know, some ideas about like techniques that you're interested in for the future um, mm -hmm. or uh, new science that you're um, hoping to do? Yeah, yeah, the, there is. I, I have a concrete answer for you. The science I hope to do is get um, about 50 grand, get an EEG, put that into the practice and become one of the first ones 
that uses EEG to guide your TMS intervention. Because if I'm able to measure, like that's, if you have a heart problem and you go to your doctor and they, what are they gonna do? They're gonna get a stethoscope and they're gonna get an EKG and they're gonna measure what that pump does. And they're gonna give you a medicine and then you're gonna come back and then we're gonna repeat those measurements and see what changed. Like that, it's not real hard here, that this is science 101. Um, but we don't do that in, in depression. We don't do that um, in a lot of these treatment regimes because EEG, um, yeah, you know, it, it's not, I don't, I don't wanna be too callous about this, but it, it comes down to money. If you are gonna get reimbursed by, for, by insurance for treating uh, someone with depression, a TMS session, that session's gonna take, we're gonna bill it at 30 minutes, and you're gonna get reimbursed as a doctor around $400 for that 30 minute session. Um, if I come to you and super great scientists and say, hey doc, I've got this EEG thing that can help you diagnose your patient and monitor their outcome, but it takes 15 minutes to do. Well, the, the metric of success for your business enterprise is butts and chair per hour. That is how you're gonna get that reimbursement over time. So if I add 15 minutes to your uh, patient encounter, then I've taken 25% of your revenue for the day, even though I'm able to, to vastly increase patient outcomes. So it is not that black and white. And, and yes, I have a lot of pent up uh, anger at, uh, um, at, at our at, at institutional level approach to healthcare. But um, that, that's why I, I said, I'm just gonna put on the Thanos glove and I'll do it myself. And, and that's what we're gonna do. That with, at, at this clinic is once I get that EEG, that's how we are going to measure um, every patient's outcome because we are not beholden to any stockholders. We're beholden to the board and to science. Uh, I'm sorry, I had a follow up too. Um, so is there any uh, hope that this could be used, I guess, outside of, a, you know, going into a doctor's office, you know, yeah. something you could use in a, in a home or something? Yeah, yeah, th there is definitely hope for that. And the, the way you get there is by proving its efficacy that in the 70s, I could say, I've got this crazy technology that can see inside your knee using magnets, and it's gonna cost like $2,000, but your insurance would never reimburse it. But um, pilot study after pilot study showed the utility of it, and over time, it was more cost effective to get you that MRI scan, inform the orthopedic surgeon of where the exact problem is, and save all that rehab time, so in the long run, it was less expensive. And that's how MRI went from a you know, Star Trek level magic technology in the 70s to you bust your knee, you can go get uh, MRI for about 150 bucks, which is reasonable. And TMS is still in the unreasonable um, phase because if you do break your knee, you're gonna get an X-ray. Who takes that X-ray? An X-ray tech. It's not a radiologist MD who is lining up the thing. It, um, there, there are you know, levels of care to, to make that economy of scale work. Right now, TMS is new. It's a baby. It has been FDA approved since 2008, which is nothing in, in medical device land, a, a decade. Um, so in order to, to get TMS at the standard level of care, it's got to be a medical doctor psychiatrist who administers it, not a TMS tech. And, and getting to that, that point of having, um, what, what I'd also like to go next is into community colleges and start developing a nationally accredited program to where you can say, young person, I've got a career field for you. Got time for one more question? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Toe, for the excellent, very excellent presentation. I loved your interpretation of this last painting too. That's a like to th see bravery and courage in this painting is very different than what I have also thought of too. So thank you for also just opening um, all of our eyes in many different ways. Um, and we have talked before um, mm -hmm. in your preparation, and I give you a tour of the show, um, just about the different emotions that goes on in um, Matthew Wong's work, um, not just melancholy. And I just, one thing that you talked about, I'm just very, just curious, more of curiosity mm -hmm. about nostalgia. One of the paintings yeah. you saw nostalgia in it, and you said that it's very similar to, not that you were making that connection, but yeah, yeah. Um, nostalgia and PTSD mm -hmm. too is very, so just, just that curiosity, wanted to learn more about how that um, relates. 
Well, actually, I, I do remember our walk around the gallery, and it, I, uh, I wanted to get it into the presentation, but you know, also manage the time. But you told me something when we we were halfway through um, the exhibit of that blue period. You, um, it, it was a canvas with a, a large sheet of black, and you told me you can't finesse black. That that is the um, it, it is a way for a master to reveal themselves, where something that that is so simple but requires a um, you know, there's no better way to put it, a, a master's technique. And it was uh, in there, the, the, the resonance of you can't finesse black is you can't dance around the, the, the issues that he was dealing with. And uh, that nostalgia, you know, as is anciently defined, it's a, a yearning for the past um, or, you know, a, a desire to be not in the present, to reset to before the pain. And that, and what also struck me um, when we were talking about, you know, Matthews, whether there was PTSD or not, I, I say only half jokingly that there's no such thing as PTSD because the P stands for post and that trauma is never ending. It is ongoing. So it, it needs a different name and it needs a different representation. There's a, I think for, for him, if you're trying to, to get to that idealistic nostalgic reset, it doesn't exist. Thank you so much to Dr. Toll and thank you all for being here. Please, if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out the exhibition, Matthew Wong, The Realm of Appearances, before it leaves us this month. Thank you so much. Thank you.